Welcome to Hard Talk. I'm Stephen Sacker. The death toll from COVID-19 in the US has risen beyond 70,000. It is expected to top 100,000 by the end of the month. At the same time, Donald Trump is doubling down on his calls for American states to ease the lockdown and get back to work. In this presidential election year, dealing with the pandemic has become the dominant political issue. Well, my guest today is Jamie Harrison, a senior official in the Democratic Party who is running for the US Senate in South Carolina. Has COVID-19 changed America's political landscape? Jamie Harrison in South Carolina, welcome to Hard Talk. Thank you, Stephen. It's good to see you again. Well, it's great to have you back on this show. I, I wonder, as a politician who is running for the U.S. Senate in November, I just wonder whether COVID-19 and the pandemic feels like it's changed everything in U.S. politics right now. Stephen, you're right. It has changed everything. There, there is now a new normal uh, as it relates to even uh, campaigning. We were one of the very first uh, Senate campaigns that pulled down all of our public events and went virtual. Uh, so ever since uh, the beginning of March, we have been doing virtual everything and from town halls to even our community service initiative. We've been uh, raising funds for community organizations online in order to support the efforts that, that they're doing in the communities. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's different. It is very, very different. And for many U.S. politicians, you know, we're so used to having these large gatherings and rallies uh, in the South, our fish fries and spaghetti dinners, uh, you know, it's food and, and, and getting people together is very uh, integral in terms of how you campaign, particularly in the South. Uh, but we're not able to do that right now. And so it, it's different. You paint a graphic picture of the way politics works in the Deep South, but I, I, I just wonder whether it's a real problem for you as, as a challenger, the underdog. You're a Democrat who's facing uh, Senator Lindsey Graham, who's held the South Carolina Senate seat, or one of the two of them, for a long time. And because you're not getting the exposure, because you're not able to do the rallies, doesn't it play into the hands of, of the incumbent? You know, I can see that the, there, there's an advantage for some incumbents in, in this race, but I, I don't see that in my particular race. And that's because the frustration level with Lindsey Graham is so high in the state. Uh, there are a lot of people who are very agitated by our senator, even in this, the, the age of talking about the coronavirus. Uh, he's put his foot in his mouth multiple times. Right now, he's demonizing many of the, the folks here in South Carolina. There are almost a half a million people who have claimed unemployment. Uh, so Lindsey Graham right now is fighting. He said over his dead body will the U.S. Senate allow for an extension of the $600 benefit to those individuals. Uh, and that's making a lot of people agitated and upset. And so, uh, you know, for many uh, incumbents versus challengers, the incumbent does have an advantage, but we don't see that in, in our particular race. I've been looking at a lot of polling uh, across the U.S. about people's attitudes as this pandemic uh, sweeps across the United States. And there seems to be, in a sense, a real contradiction in people's attitudes. On the one hand, a clear majority uh, say that they believe their lives will return to normal within the next few months. But at the same time, a clear majority say that they believe America will never be the same again, that it will have long term consequences in terms of work, health care, education, travel and even socializing as well. As a politician, what is your message to the people of South Carolina that this is a watershed moment that changes everything in America or simply that this needs managing so that America can go back to normal? You know, I think I think things will change in this country as a result of the coronavirus. It has exposed some of the disparities that have been here for generations. And, and now we are seeing how they can be uh, uh, how they're amplified and impacting 
all types of communities, not just our poor communities or communities of color or rural communities, but all of our communities. And so what it's going to, what it's going to mean is that we're, we're going to need a whole new generation of political leaders in this country that will focus on making sure that if this type of situation happen again, that some of the difficulties that people are experiencing right now are not the, it, that is not what happens the next time around. Uh, you know, from the health care disparities to, you know, just the fact that here in South Carolina, prior to the coronavirus, a third of our state did not have access to broadband. So just think about that. This is 2020. It, it should be that uh, just like you have electricity lines going into your home, you should have broadband being piped into your home. Interesting that you say this is a time that calls for a new generation of political leaders. Of course, the truth is that your country is led by a 70-something and he's being challenged for the White House by another 70-something. And isn't the reality that you have to face as a Democrat in South Carolina that right now, for good or ill, President Donald Trump is dominating the political debate. He's sucking out all of the oxygen from the air when it comes to the United States and its response to coronavirus. And the Democrats look as though, frankly, they, they, they don't really have much to say. Oh, well, I'm not seeing that from our perspective. Uh, at this point, you take a look at the polling number right now. And, and when folks are taking a look at uh, the performance from the White House, uh, it's not very positive. And it's partly because what we're seeing is instead of having uh, leadership on all levels, from the federal to the state to the local, all singing from the same hymn books, you're seeing this um, uh, discombobulated uh, sense of strategy. And what the American people need right now is a steady hand. The, the American people need, uh, need someone who, uh, or a group of leaders who will focus on doing what is in the best interest of the people of this great nation and, and to do it sing, singing from the same hymn book. And so um, we're not seeing that from the White House right now. I mean, many times some of these conferences, the, the, the president will say one thing and his advisors will say another. And so we just need to focus on um, letting folks understand that things are going to get better. Uh, there's going to be some hard times. But things will get better and will provide the type of leadership that they need. Just seems uh, the, the Democratic Party uh, has a message right now, which is telling the U.S. public that Donald Trump, in his constant messaging that America needs to get back to work, needs to be open for business, your party's message seems to be that, that Mr. Trump is obsessed with putting money over human life with markets over medicine, as one progressive wrote in the New York Times recently. But that could backfire on you guys, because there is no doubt the American people who've seen unemployment in the last six weeks saw by some, what, 25 to 30 million new jobless, they want to get back to work. Well, I think we all want to get back to, to some sense of normalcy. And, and I think that's what you're hearing from our, our party as well. But we understand this. The greatest asset, the thing that makes America great is not just, yes, we have great businesses and, and corporations, but the thing that makes this country great are our people. And we got to first and foremost, make sure that we are investing in the greatest asset that we have, which are our people. And that's all of the people, not just a, a select group or a select few. And so that's what we're working on right now, making sure that we're doing things that are really in the best interest. That's what I'm working on on my campaign right now. I'm making sure that the seniors are taken care of in, in this country I'm make, or in South Carolina. I'm making sure uh, that the folks who are essential workers, these are people who are making barely minimum wage, that we take care of them as well. And so that's the greatest asset, because if we don't take care yeah, but, of the people... But, but, uh, but, 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 but hang on, ha hang on, Jamie Harrison. Let, let's be specific about this. You know, South Carolina has a governor, a Republican governor, who wants to get stuff opened as quickly as possible. I believe he's announced that restaurants will soon be able to serve customers again, albeit out of doors. He then wants to open them up more widely. He wants to get retail going again. He wants to get people going back to work on a much larger scale. He says that it's time. Are you saying to your people in South Carolina that he's wrong? 
I'm saying that right now, the, the medical experts have not said that this is good. When you look at South Carolina and the escalation of the coronavirus cases here, there has not been a decline in South Carolina. Not at all. Uh, it, it, there has not been a day that's been less than the day before. And so that great brings me great cause and, and, and caution. And so what you're seeing is, and what I mentioned earlier on, that you're seeing that what is said on the state level is sometimes what is different on the local level. So many of the mayors, when the governor moved to open up our beaches, the mayors of those towns said, no, you're not. You're not opening up our beaches because we don't want to see an increase in coronavirus cases. Where, where, so, where, with all of this debate about whether it's time and the dangers of opening up too soon, where is Joe Biden? You know, he's your figurehead. He is the guy who's going to take your party through the November presidential election. And to quote one progressive uh, lawyer and commentator in the Nation magazine, uh, Eli, uh, Eli Mistal, he says, Joe Biden has got to do better. If he wants to act like, if he wants to be a president, he's got to start acting like one. He goes on to say, Elizabeth Warren has a more concrete and detailed plan for taking her dog on a walk than Joe Biden does for leading this country through the current tragedy. What's going on? Listen, uh, the Vice President Biden has been, and every day that I see, he's always on uh, television talking about what we need to do as a nation right now. He's bringing some calm to, to this storm that we are constantly in. And that's what we all have to do. That's what I'm trying to do on, on my race. You know, my grandma had a saying that, Jamie, you control what you can control. And, and that means you do what you can do within the power that you have to do it. And, and I think that's what the vice president is doing. He's trying to be a sense of calm in, in this really great storm that we have. I'm trying to be a sense of calm here in South Carolina. We are doing things on the ground to help people right now. Uh, you know, we have this program called Harrison Helps, where we have helped 10,000 people. We fed folks. Uh, we've given them hygiene kits. We've done things on the ground to help people. And, and so I constantly tell folks, go to my website, uh, jamieharrison.com. See what we are doing in order to bring some calm here to South you, Carolina. And let leadership. me be blunt. Do you think race is a part of this debate in the sense that we've seen COVID-19 has disproportionately hit the uh, black, Latino, the ethnic minority communities across the United States and in your state of South Carolina. Do you think that Donald Trump, in his desire to open up the country, get back to business, all those phrases he uses, is discounting those lives? Well, it, it's, it's not about, I think, discounting lives, but the existing health disparities, the, the existing racial disparities, the existing economic disparities that were here prior to COVID are now, again, being amplified because of the situation that we're in. Many of the essential workers, the people who are working at grocery stores, the people who are working in all of these uh, jobs that we need to, to, to still operate, those, the folks who occupy those jobs are, it tends to be minorities or lower income folks. And so these folks are at the front lines. They don't have the opportunity to say that they can work from home because, uh, because of the economic anxieties and disparities that they face. And so right now what it is exposing is those dis disparities that we have in our society. And that's what we have to work on. We have to work on here in South Carolina, the lack of Medicaid expansion. You know, uh, Republicans refuse to expand Medicaid to give uh, health insurance to workers in the state. As a result, that has amplified the problem that we have. Rural hospitals have closed in South Carolina. That The, the COVID have amplified that particular situation. And so uh, we, that means then once we get out of this, we need to address those problems that are underlying uh, in, in, this, in this pandemic that we're facing right now. One other element of, of Donald Trump's messaging that you in the Democratic Party are going to have to figure out how to deal with is his now constant attacks on China. He began by calling it the Wuhan and the Chinese virus, and right now he's saying that there has to be a way in which China pays for what he describes as uh, the Chinese failure to, to control the pandemic. Now, I wonder how you Democrats are going to deal with that. I'm noticing a lot of candidates across the United States on the Republican side are now talking of, 
making China pay. Uh, the public, according to the polls, now take a very negative view of China's role. So what are you and your party going to say? Well, right now, I think the, the people that I talk to, the small business owners here in South Carolina, the folks that are working um, in some of our hospitals that still don't have PPEs, uh, instead of talking about China, they want to hear from our leaders right now, how are you going to make sure that we have the materials that we need in order to protect ourselves, our families, and our communities? And so that's that's should be our focus right now. You know, this, uh, you know, tit and tat back and forth between China and the United States. You can do that after the uh, coronavirus has passed us. Let's focus on the fact that people are suffering right now. Folks don't have jobs. S some people still don't have the the uh, the payments from the the CARES Act the, the, that that you know, the White House and the Senate and the House promised them that they would get. Focus on the people of South Carolina and the people across this country. Use the, all of the other political stuff with China when, when we have the, the bandwidth in order to focus on that. We don't have the patience right now to, to address that in, in our state. Let's, uh, let's consider whether you've been reading U.S. politics right over the last couple of years, because I'm very mindful that a couple of years ago, you uh, spoke to me and you said this, uh, what Donald Trump's doing to the Republican Party is killing that party in the long term. He is splintering it. He is almost like a secret weapon for the Democratic Party. Well, here we are two years on. The polls show that uh, Donald Trump still has an incredibly loyal core support. Admittedly, the polls also show that he may be five points behind Biden in the presidential race right now. But everybody says that in the in the key battleground states, it's too close to call. He, Donald Trump, is much more durable, is he not, than you ever expected? Well, well, just remember, I also reminded you that the Democrats were going to take the House back that, that election cycle, and they did. Um, and, and I'm going to make another, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to put my Nostradamus cap on. Jamie Harrison's going to win the U.S. Senate race against Donald Trump's good friend, Lindsey Graham, this cycle as well. Uh, listen, in, in the end of the day, what the American people are looking for is real, true, and tested leadership. Someone who is not going to demonize the American people, but is going to be there to protect them, to fight for them, and to push for them, their families, and their communities. And that's what Democrats, that's what Joe Biden, that's what I'm trying to do right now on this race each and every day. Now, the Republicans have their own battles that they have to deal with, and I'll let them deal with that. But I think what we can control is the message that we put out, the policies that we put forward, and, and making our case to the American people that under our leadership, things will get better. Uh, that you don't have to worry about crazy t tweets at night, that you can focus on, and, and we can focus on uh, the issues that you're dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. Not harken back to the past, but look to the future of where this country and where my state is going. And that, that's what we're focused on at right now. I, I, I want to talk about your state because it is very interesting to look at whether you as a Democrat can make a breakthrough in the South. But before we do that, just one more question on the, the horse race for the White House. How comfortable are you uh, supporting Joe Biden, you've come out in strong support of him, when you, over years, have been uh, a man who's defended women's rights, has spoken out very strongly on feminist issues, and you now find, find that Joe Biden is facing accusations from Tara Reid that uh, way back in the early 1990s, he sexually assaulted her uh, uh, in the US, uh, the, the, the US Congress building. It's very hard for some Democrats not to take seriously the, the painful words coming from a woman who feels she was abused by Joe Biden. Listen, I, I believe we should always listen to women and we should thoroughly review all of these allegations that come up. And, and, I, and I believe that's what's happened in this case. The media has thoroughly reviewed the Washington Post and New York Times, these claims. 
And there's just nothing that I've read in the news thus far or have seen from those reports and assessments that uh, that I've heard that has shaken my confidence in, in Vice President Biden. And so, you know, I'm going to always keep an open mind. I'm always going to listen to to hear and these uh, these allegations and to see the review of those claims, uh, to, to see the validity of those claims. And again, I, I haven't seen anything that I, uh, that I've read thus far that has shaken my confidence. You, uh, you said you're going to be Nostradamus and you're going to predict your own victory in November in South Carolina, but the polls suggest you're not going to win. Lindsey Graham has a lead over you, just as Donald Trump still has a lead over Joe Biden in South Carolina, according to the polls. Isn't the truth that in the South, the Democratic Party still has a fundamental problem? And it certainly isn't making inroads amongst the working class, the poorer white people, that you would need to draw into your coalition if you're to win in South Carolina. Oh, that is, that is not, that's a, a bunch of falseness there. Listen, in the end of the day, the, the, the poll that, we're, that is the most valuable poll is a poll that takes place in November when all of the people go to the polls and actually cast their ballots. What we are seeing here in South Carolina is the emergence of what I call a new South, a new South that is bold, that is inclusive, that's diverse. The coalition that we're building, you know, I'm running against a guy who's been in Washington, D.C. for well over 20 years, right? I'm a newcomer. I'm this poor kid that grew up in Orangeburg, South Carolina, that grew up on welfare and food stamps. Last quarter, I outraised Lindsey Graham. I raised $7.35 million to his 5.6. I hear you. I hear you. But look at all of the names that we've seen who have been regarded as the bright new hopes of the Democratic Party in the South in recent years. I'm thinking of Stacey Abrams in, in Georgia, Andrew Gillum, uh, Beto O'Rourke in Texas. All of these names, they all have one thing in common. They ended up losing. And you're probably going to end up losing too. Well, Stephen, I don't think so, my friend. As again, as I told you that the Dems were going to win the House, we're going to win the Senate, and I'm going to win also. And part of that is we are seeing a changing of the guard here in South Carolina. Just this week, this past week, Dick Wilkerson, who was the head of Michelin North America, the largest uh, corporation in South Carolina. This is a guy who's worked with Lindsey Graham who worked with me. He supported Lindsey Graham. He was on Lindsey Graham's finance, co-chair of Lindsey Graham's finance committee when he ran for president. Dick Wilkerson came out and supported me in this race. That's huge. And it's sort of, I give you the, the uh, equivalence, think of Mount Olympus. That's what Michelin is here in South Carolina. And, and Dick Wilkerson was Zeus. And is having Zeus come on your side and saying, you know what, Jamie, you're going to win this race. And that's why we know we're going to do it. Well, Zeus is a kind of cool guy to have on your side. But rather more important is having all the Bernie Sanders supporters on your side, at least maybe not so much in South Carolina, but certainly across the country. The Democratic Party is not going to take back the White House unless all of those leftists and progressives within the Democratic Party make common cause with Joe Biden and people like you, a, a well-known centrist. But the progressives look at the Biden agenda right now, they see very little, to quote some of them, that is different, frankly, from Donald Trump. Why are the Sanders people going to come over to you in November? This is what I've been telling folks across South Carolina and, and you know, the message that I've, I've relayed to Vice President Biden. In the end of the day, this is not about Democrat versus Republican. It's not about progressive versus conservative. It's about what's right versus what is wrong. There's a lot of wrong that is going on right now in the United States. There's a lot that is wrong going on right now here in South Carolina. If we as a party and as leaders of this party can focus on the right things, we will see that we will attract not only Democrats, but progressives, independents, and even some moderate Republicans on board. We have already seen that in this race, and you will see more of that as we get closer to November. Jamie Harrison, we've run out of time. I thank you very much for being on Hard Talk. We will revisit this after the November election. Thanks very much for joining me. Always good seeing you, Stephen. Take care.